Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this time we're going to look at some basic facial animation. I recently did some work animating a Crypt Keeper head for Dreams user Raptor Printer and wanted to pass on what I learned through my struggles, so let's get to it. I'm in a new scene, and for purposes of illustration, I'm going to grab a sculpture from the Dreamiverse to show how you might approach this subject from a more neutral place than something you've kind of designed for the purpose. Think of this like you too can animate a face. I have grabbed Shouting Head Sculpture by Billy underscore Shears. This is a fantastic sculpture from a new Dreams user. This is the second thing they've uploaded and it's already this good, so this is someone to keep an eye on. Out of the box, this sculpture came with a bunch of stuff we don't need for the purposes of this video, so I just deleted all that and we're ready to go. By the way, if you can find or make a sculpture like this with an open mouth, it really helps when you get around to making the mouth open and close. The objective here is to break the sculpt up into a bunch of parts that we can move. So the first thing we'll do is copy it a bunch of times. I will use one copy per part that I want to reproduce, and we will start by excising the jaw from the first one. The first thing I want to do is match colors so that we don't have any undesirable tones showing up when we start cutting and blending this shape down to our objective. I'm going to start hacking away with large stamped negative spheres. You can accomplish this any way you want. The end product is more important than the process. I'll share something I've learned about cutting speaker and electrical wire. It's always better to cut it too long than too short. In the same way, when you're chopping these down to constituent parts, it's better to leave some extra than to cut away too much and have to figure out a band-aid later. It just so happens this was my second attempt with this shape, so I knew I was going to need to cut it down quite a bit, but to start, I would try to cut this piece like a whole jawbone just in case. You also want to include the lower half of the mouth. Think of a ventriloquist dummy, but we're moving the whole lower jaw, and not just a little square through the chin. We'll then take that part and return it back to the mothership. When you bring these parts back to the home object, initially you want to offset them just a little. This way everything stays organized in its place, but none of your parts get lost in the original and they all stay accessible. For the jaw in particular, we'll place this at what will be its resting position in the final object with the mouth closed. The jaw is something of a special case because it is resting in a different position from the original. This means we will have to excavate some of the original around it. You can see that with the mouth closed this way, we have an extra mouth in the neck area, and that's the sort of thing we don't want to keep under most circumstances. So I will trim that up and again less is more and you can trim it up more later if you need to. One concern with the mouth in this position is making sure that the original doesn't poke through when the mouth is open. That is not the case with this sculpture but you want to check with the jaw sculpt in both a closed and open position when altering the base original so that you have unimpeded basic travel of the jaw. Each face is different and some can be tricky, but you just have to roll with the cards you're dealt and figure it out. So this is fine for now, and since we weren't too aggressive, we can always go back and fine tune it later. When you're looking at a face for animation like this, you want to ask yourself what parts of the face really move when talking or expressing. And lots of parts of the face move, so you can make it super complicated if you want. But for this tutorial, I'll concentrate on the jaw, each lip, the cheeks, lower and upper eyelids, and the brow. The rest of the parts we'll be creating are much smaller, so you'll be able to rough them out with either the cutout or crop tool. In this capacity, they do more or less the same thing. It only depends whether or not you want to retain the rest of this particular head aside from the part you're removing. For a lot of these shapes, you can use the curve tool to get the rough cut and then adjust from there. 
All right, we have that cut out and then we want to trim it up to get rid of undesirable pieces like that floating chunk or the little bits of teeth. These parts will reside in and move out of the original shape. Most of the time they'll be hidden so they don't need to be perfect, but you do want to retain the general shape of the original. So I'll finish that up and move that part back to the original. The lower lip is also a bit of a special case because it will be anchored to the jaw rather than the rest of the head. So we want to line that up with the lip on the jaw. Chances are pretty good we've removed the lower lip from the original anyway while accommodating the new jaw. I have the jaw pulled down a little to make it easier to place the lip, but all of this will be adjusted later when we attach the jaw to the rest of the head and figure out the best way to hinge it. Here I'll just move the part heads a little closer as we continue our part assembly line. I'll continue cutting out parts until I reach the symmetrical pieces. On this head the cheeks, eyes, and brows appear to be symmetrical. This offers you a choice. Do you cut out each side independently and end up with something slightly different? Or do you cut out one and then copy and flip it? There is no right answer, the choice is yours. For the sake of the tutorial I will cut out one part and then copy and flip it. If your face is not symmetrical you will probably cut out each piece independently, but who knows, maybe the other way would yield interesting results. As it turns out I end up with a surplus of heads because I can do things like cut a single chunk out for the eye and then split that into the four parts needed for each upper and lower eyelid. So I continue cutting out parts and moving them over to the original base head. I am keeping things coarse so I can grab these parts for later adjustment once they're all cut out. All of our parts are staged and now we can start with assembly. You have to decide what kind of motion you want these parts to have. For this method we will be animating everything with a single keyframe that moves the part from its resting position to its active position. When you do that with an object's position, that object will move in a straight line between the two positions. This is not always desirable, like with the jaw for instance. We want that to move in an arc, so we use a bolt connector to determine how it will travel. It's important to note this is just one way of doing this, and it is a basic way that shows people who haven't done much animation, hey, you can animate a basic face, and it's not that difficult, so quit being so shy and give it a shot. With the bolt connector you'll need to do some adjusting of the fulcrum point in order to get the exact sweep that you're looking for. Basic things to remember are that your arc is described as part of a circle between the fulcrum and the surface you're moving. So with this jaw for instance, the further toward the back of the head you place the fulcrum, the closer the arc will be to a line. Closer to the front of the jaw and you get a more dramatic sweep. A quick word about movement. All of these parts are going to be moving as your character talks or expresses itself and you want your character and your character's head to be able to move through space like normal. However, if you do things a certain way, keyframes and connectors do not accomplish this and you can see all sorts of bizarre behavior. The first step in making sure that does not happen is to make sure all of your parts are scoped into the base sculpt or that they're all grouped together. When you do this, it is the group that moves through the scene space, and then if you set the parts a certain way, they will move relative to the group. The only exception in this video will be the lower lip, which is scoped in with the jaw because we want that to move relative to the jaw. The jaw will then move relative to the head group. Right here I'll quickly spend some time fine-tuning the position of the various parts which will not be hinged. 
When you do this, you want to still leave some tiny part protruding from the base sculpt. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to grab when you need to move it, and sometimes it's even difficult to find. I skipped the part where I adjusted the cheeks because I screwed around with it for way too long, but that part is done at this point as well. I have myself a microchip and that is where I will place all of my keyframes so they stay organized and easily accessible. All of my parts are in position except for the eyelids which I think are better baselined as closed, but I'll get to that later. It doesn't matter what order you do these keyframes in, I'm doing them from top to bottom so I'll start with the jaw. When you put the keyframe down, it is set to start recording and any changes you make to pretty much anything will be recorded. For the jaw, we will drag that down until the mouth is sufficiently open and then we will hit the record button to solidify that keyframe. You want to name each one so it's easier to keep track of which is which when you're building your animation schemes later. You'll notice that the jaw is closed again. This is because the keyframe doesn't have power. When the keyframe has power, the mouth will be open and that will be the basis for our animation schemes. Most of the rest of these keyframes will be linear movement. All you really have to remember is that the baseline is at rest and your keyframe is for action. So you're going to move the various parts from, from their rest position to their action position and hit the record button just like we did with the jaw. In this video with the exception of the eyelids and jaw, the resting position is the same as where that part was in the original sculpt. The action position is up to you and what looks good varies with each sculpt. You may find by moving things around that your parts sculpts need to be altered, so do it. With the lips, I'm taking the easy way out and making it so that each lip can move closer to the center of the mouth. The movement of the lips allows you to approximate sound shapes. The more types of keyframes you have for the lips, the more sounds you'll be able to better emulate. So you might also want a keyframe that allows you to move the lips away from the center of the mouth. If you do that, you'll need to remove some of the original lip or remodel it completely. Then the original part will move into the face, revealing your open lip position on the base sculpt. Certain sounds need the mouth to be in very particular shapes, like O, oh, so you might need to make a special sculpt for that. Some sounds involve the teeth or the tongue, so you might want to animate those. You can have dozens of parts moving and the more you have, the more types of sounds and expressions you'll be able to emulate. I was talking earlier about getting everything properly grouped into the same sculpt. Part of that is making sure that each part is set up correctly, so you want those to be set movable and collidable off and ignore gravity on. Movable off is a little counterintuitive, but that is movable in terms of the physics engine. With the keyframes, we are setting the position of the object directly. We want that movement to be very specific and we don't want the physics engine interfering. Essentially what we're doing is letting the engine know that we are taking control of where things will be. I set the upper lip and the cheeks as linear so they don't need any sort of connectors and I burned through those real quick. No worries about process, I'll show that with the eyebrows. My original plan with both sets of eyelids was to have them move in a linear fashion as well, but they look like crap that way so I'm setting them up with some bolt connectors to get them to move in a sweep. With the cheeks, each set of eyelids and the eyebrows, you can set them up to move independently by giving each one its own keyframe. I'm moving them all as pairs for the video because independent movement takes twice as long to set up and it makes hooking up your animation scheme take twice as long as well. Not quality, not quantity, I always say. Alright, I got done screwing around with bolt connectors and I have placed my eyelids into a closed resting position. You can leave them open if you want. I think it's easier to make them more expressive this way. Question. How do you get a pair of independent sculptures moving together with a single keyframe? Answer. Put the keyframe down, 
move the two sculptures into their respective action positions and hit the record button to finalize. That was easy. Nothing new on the upper eyelid, so we'll blow through those real fast and then get to the eyebrows. There isn't any big secret to these, but they are slightly different than the ones with the bolt connector, so I want to show at least a portion of this at regular speed. Another thing I'll do differently with these is make two keyframes for the same moving part. One will be brow up for surprise expressions, the other will be brow down for anger. And you can actually power those up together in all sorts of ways to get the brows doing different transitions. So the main thing with these linear parts is keeping in mind that they will move in a line from the resting position to where you set them. So you need to be aware of what they'll move through to get there and what they'll look like each step of the way. Once you've found a path that looks good all the way through, go for it. For many parts you can convey convincing motion by having a part move just a little in a linear direction and the base sculpt and the part combined will look more like the thing is growing or morphing. That's as important as your parts ending up in the right action position. Keyframes are done and I have grabbed a sound sample from the Dreamiverse by the underscore other underscore Lucas. I have placed that in a timeline and I will try to match my animation with that sound. You're not going to hear that sound because I have my headphones on while recording so I could hear it. However, you'll get a chance to hear it near the end of the video with all the animation completed. There are lots of ways to do your animation scheme, but I like to use switches and a timeline to trigger the keyframes. This keeps things organized. I don't have to wonder which keyframes are which, and this also allows me to trigger more than one at the same time for synchronized actions without having to lay down each keyframe involved. The switch has power whenever the playhead of the timeline is over it, so you just place one where you want a keyframe powered and then wire the output of the switch to the power input of the keyframe. I think it's easiest to get a basic mimicking of the mouth movement based on the waveform of the sound and then progress from there. You can't tell exactly what's happening with a spoken recording by the waveform, but it will tell you a couple of things. You can see where sound is and where it isn't, so you know when something is being said and when it isn't. You can also see when the volume is loud or quiet, so you have a general idea of how much the mouth of your puppet should be open at a given time. If you don't know what a waveform is or how it works, it's a representation of a sound over time. You can see it in the sound old man comment voice test. The waveform is the squiggly black part and it reads from left to right over time. The left side is the start of the sound, the right side is the end. When the sound has volume, you see a black squiggle. The absence of a squiggle means there is no sound being made. The wider the squiggle is height-wise, the louder the sound is. With all that information combined, you can get a rough idea of what the mouth should be doing. As far as the switches go, you can set them so that they aren't simply off and on. If you grab the white dot handles on the top of them in the timeline, you can fade power in and out. The amount of power a keyframe receives is the amount that its position changes between your resting position and the action position you set with the keyframe. Full power on the switch will be full power on the keyframe and you end up with the action position. No power on the switch will be no power on the keyframe and you will have the resting position. Half power on the switch will be half power on the keyframe and the object will be exactly halfway between the resting position and the action position. By fading power in and out on the switch, the amount of power changes smoothly over time and the object will move smoothly between the resting position and the action position over time. You can also have overlapping switches running to the same keyframe and if their linear power fades overlap, you end up with a power curve, so your changes in position don't need to occur in a strictly linear fashion over time. Once you've laid down a rough idea of what you think the mouth does based on the waveform, you hook those switches up to your jaw keyframe's power. At this point we have a very roughly animated jaw, and it looks like this.
You may be very happy with that and the level of detail you strive for is up to you. You can sink lots and lots of time into getting it very realistic or maybe you just have a robot mouth that doesn't need to do anything more complicated than that. But we're working on a human face and we want to try to give it a little more expression than just a flapping mouth. The switches we have currently convey a certain rhythm and if you think about it certain parts of your face will tend to move in unison when expressing something so you may be able to reuse these switches to move other parts as well. If you give a cheery hey, you'll notice your mouth opens quite a bit, your cheeks move, your eyes widen, and your eyebrows raise, and they all pretty much move in the same way at the same time. In that case, you can hook up all your hey parts to the same switch instead of having a dedicated switch for each piece. Right now I'm fine tuning the jaw movement a little, but let's move on to hook up some other parts and talk about how those might work, especially the lips. Here I have multiple parts hooked up to some of our original switches for the jaw, in addition to some hooked up to the eyelids, and I'm going to start to add some lip movements. We have built in the ability for the upper and lower lips to swell toward the center of the mouth, and those are generally useful for conveying pursed lip sounds like W's and B's at the beginning of words, or O's and M's in the middle of words. My advice is to use your own face as a guide, see what your lips do, and then try to emulate with the animations you have available. On my Crypt Keeper example, I also made it so that the upper lip could lift, and that proved particularly useful for sounds where the upper lip thins out, like H's or F's. Here's a look at the lips. Our lip actions aren't real obvious with this model, but you can see a little lip pursing here and there, and sometimes a little is enough. It doesn't always need to be totally realistic to convey that the character is delivering the line. Back to the eyelids and they are closed by default. That works well with this setup because while eyes are open most of the time, they're not completely open, and this way allows you to get your eyes semi-closed a little more convincingly. One thing that's important to note for eyes is that your bottom lids will very rarely be completely open outside of shock and surprise. You can also get some interesting squinting effects by moving the upper eyelids and leaving the lower ones untouched. Your lower lids tend to move some with your cheeks, so you'll get a lot of movement out of those while speaking. This is another advantage of having your eyelids closed by default. Another good thing to remember is that blinks are generally quick and you can go from 0% power to 100% power instantly without much problem. Also, some partial closing of the upper lids between words is very expressive and you can achieve that with overlapping switches for a smooth power curve like we talked about before. So here's a taste of the final product for you with audio this time. Awesome! A real roller coaster! Awesome! A real roller coaster! Not perfect by any means, but it's a start and hopefully it gives you some ideas for how you might like to implement various animations yourself. Plenty of videos yet to come, I'll be back in VR shortly seeing how the moves work out and reporting the results, so stay tuned for that. But that's all for now, until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.